first, let me thank uh, Grime and the team at CFO South Africa for inviting me to speak here for the second year. I was here last year and my topic was quite contentious. And for those of you who don't know what happened, is so I came last year and I spoke a lot about why the things we're doing in developing entrepreneurs in this country were not going to work. I spoke about why finance professionals were a part of the problem in how we really diversify the country's base. I spoke about why the structure of the economy was wrong, exclusive by its nature, and built on the premise that you can only build the economy by keeping the majority of its people living below the quality of life they could design and live for themselves. Um, we, we then took the video and posted it online, and for the first two months of the video being online, are subjected to all sorts of racist vitriol. It was absolutely the most fascinating thing to watch. But as I imagine is the nature of South Africans, the message kind of caught wind and people kind of came onto the bandwagon. And then a dialogue, a real dialogue developed about where we are as a country and what needs to happen. So before I start, let me make these couple of disclaimers, if I may. First, I can almost guarantee that all of you will be offended by something I'm going to say. <laughs> Black, white, other. <laughs> See, first bit of offense just there. So I can almost guarantee, at some point or other, I will offend almost every single person in this room. That's the first disclaimer. The second disclaimer is this. I spent a decade of my life getting on the platform and telling people what they wanted to hear. And then I had an awakening in my life when I realized that when you tell people what they want to hear, they don't do what they have to do. So part of the responsibility, the obligation we all carry in all of our spaces is to have the courage to speak the truth. Now, all of us have a sense of truth. But for most of us, the truth is the things we say in our cars with our partners with our kids sitting in the back seat. The truth is the thing we say in our bride with our friends on the Saturday when we talk about them and the state of the country and the corruption and how bad things are. In a public platform where we are exposed to all sorts of perspectives, nationalities, races, genders, and all kinds of biases, we dare speak the truth. And then the third final bit. I love my country, I do. But I think one of the things that holds us back as South Africans is we love to pretend the past didn't exist. In fact, it's a South African pastime. We're really good at this. We're really good at pretending our past is an imagination, a manufacture of people that are trying to push a certain political agenda. The reason we do this is because if we pretend for a moment it wasn't as bad as they say, or we pretend for a moment it wasn't as vast as they say, then we don't have to own the responsibility of what that past has brought into our present. Consider for a moment, if you will, your life today is nothing more than a manifestation of events in the past. Your perspective, your education, your history, your financial background, the decisions you're making, where you live, all of that is predetermined by the history of where we come from. Those of you here who are in South Africa because you come from Zimbabwe are probably here because of the most recent history of your own country. As a Zulu man, I know that I owe my lineage not only to the Zulu people, but also the Swazi people. That's my birthright. It is a split of my lineage. And even at a personal level, I own that I am in Gauteng because it is a migrant province. The history of how my grandfather, my great-grandfather first moved here. Moving from Swaziland and then moved into Mpumalanga, from Pumalanga into Alex, from Alex into Benoni. That history is predetermined by the fact that this province is a migrant province. I cannot stand here, 32-year-old man, educated with a master's from the UK, and say to you, well, I am just because I am. Rubbish. Bullshit. I am because the history of the people who have brought me to the space I am in has predetermined where I am today. If you want to understand how you fix the future, you first need the courage to confront the past. So today we're going to do some courageous things. Is that okay? Yeah. And then finally, we're going to have some fun. I'm going to make a lot of jokes, some of them about you. Most of them about you, actually. Actually, all of them about you. Good. So I couldn't title the presentation just because it's tough. But I wanted to start by understanding this question. What does transformation mean in the first place? 
And when we talk about this thing called transformation and building a South Africa, what do we mean? Are we transformed when we take a 100-year-old bank and put a black female as the CEO? Is that transformation? Are we transformed when you take a boardroom of one of the large four auditing companies in a partner network of 250 partners and you say 40% of them are black? Is that transformation? Or is that simply change? Consider, if you will, for a moment, that transformation is when we begin to really construct the things we are constructing for the purpose that were intended. In a country of 55 million citizens, which South Africa is today, there is an unemployment rate by the narrow definition of 28%, 27.7%, narrow definition, 40%, broad definition. That is to say, of every 10 people, four are unemployed. Of every five, two. For young black people growing up in the northern provinces, so from kind of where we are all the way to Limpopo, just close onto the border of where Zimbabwe is, for young black people growing up in the northern provinces, their probability of finding employment is 16.8% if all they have is a matric. For young white men growing up in the southern provinces, specifically the Western Cape, Cape Town here, their probability of finding employment if all they have is a matric is 82%. 82%. We're qualifying and graduating matrix today. They're coming out of our public schooling system with a maths literacy, and we're saying to them, if you get a 33% pass mark as maths literacy, you are equivalent to the world's demands of labor. For those of you who wonder, Uma Lucy has done the research on this. A 33% pass rate in maths literacy by today's standard is equal to what was in my day, grade nine, standard grade mathematics, 41%. So just to be clear, the overwhelming majority of South Africans going to the public schooling system, who are overwhelmingly what race, are coming out of a public schooling system that says to them, you can go into the world of work and not have the ability to construct a complex algebraic equation, and we deem it that you are fit for the world of work. Oh, but wait, someone needs to explain this to me. I swear the education department is run by black people, I swear. I mean, I swear. I'm not sure, but I swear. I swear, I swear. You remember that song? I swear, I swear. <laughs> so the question is, have we changed or have we transformed? When you take a price-fixing scandal, the likes of which we saw in the milling and bread industry, and you consider for a moment, if you will, that the CEO of one of the large milling companies operating in the bread sector was a black male at the time at which this thing was happening. Can you explain to me how that happens? Have we transformed or have we changed? You see it today. It's the most fascinating thing. See, in my environment, I work with large organizations and I try to convince them, I spend my time convincing them to diversify the supply chain by giving opportunities to people who have not had them in the past. And almost always, the procurement professional sitting on the other side of the chain will say, yeah, but I can't give a 20 million rand IT supply contract to a company that was started two years ago. They don't have a track record. I then say to them, have you considered for a moment there was once upon a time SAP didn't have a track record? You know there was a time Microsoft didn't have a track record? What, do you think these organizations were created by God from the beginning of time? And on the eighth day, God invented Lenovo. <laughs> so there is a set of standards that we use for some people. We don't use that set of standards for other people. Have we changed or have we really transformed? I used to sit on a board of uh, two listed companies. It was fascinating. One of them was an affordable housing business. Uh, in the affordable housing environment specifically, you raise low cost capital, you build affordable houses, and you sell it to people who are caught in what we call the middle. They're not middle class, so they can't afford typically bank funded loans at expensive rates in the suburbs, but they make more than, more than enough money to be living in the townships and they don't want to live in that space. They're kind of caught in this hybrid space, this space between. And even in that environment, you'd be fascinated, absolutely fascinated how finance professionals working in that space 
were using risk and pricing models that were developed for well complex environments at high costs of capital for an affordable housing space. And then we go, yeah, but why can't we find people to buy the houses? Well, one, because the cost of capital is high. And then when you find the person to buy the house, why do you say that? Why is the default rate so high? Well, I wonder. The default rate is high because if the cost of capital is high, and this person works in an unenvironment that demands flexible labor, and by the way, in South Africa, you miss your three payments. Three payments on your house installment, they will repossess that house quicker than you can say bank loan. But you gave the loan to this person knowing they work in a flexible labor environment. They've been a mine laborer for 20 years. They work deep in the trenches. For 20 years, they've done it. The mine goes through a bad cycle, a commodity bust a boom. They retrench a few workers, and the mine laborer is out of work for two years, and you repossess his home. Why? Because the people who constructed the risk model and the mitigation models of how we issue assets back the finance using the assets, and at what point we recall the asset back from a bad consumer, themselves were not transformed. I can guarantee you, if you walk into the risk functions of those organizations, you will find professionals of color in those spaces but we say we are transformed. You see, transformation is not substituting black with white. Transformation is transforming the reason by which you exist in the first place. That's transformation. <laughs> the comrades are quiet. Eh? Uh, let's go to the macros. I'm a master's in economics, so this wouldn't be an economics class if I didn't have some stats or data. This is just for the finance professionals to prove to you that I'm actually smart. It's not just uh, <laughs> numbers. Let's start at the macros. Let's look at South Africa for a minute. 56 million people, our GDP per capita is the highest in the province, followed by Egypt and then after that, Morocco. But we have a GDP per capita of $5,200 there, they're about. We also have close on 20% the size of our population sitting in the middle classes. This is why we are the most forthright financial market in the continent. Simply because we have a large middle class with a high GDP per capita. 90% of the citizens living in this country have access to electricity. Not all the time. And it's not cheap, but you have it. And just last year, 118 FDI projects flew into South Africa. What that means is the global economic environment likes our story. It does. Let's look at another uh, country. Let's go to Nigeria. Now, as a person who does business in Nigeria, who is busy setting up our fund in Nigeria now, we've just gotten conditional approval. Let me tell you, if you are not in Nigeria, you are not in Africa. It really is, a true story. You land in Nigeria, in Mutala Airport. It's my favorite place to go. You land in Mutala Airport, and as you land in Mutala Airport, typically, you move from mainland Lagos over the bridge, which is an eight-lane freeway bridge, from mainland Lagos into Victoria Island, where all the business gets done, VI it's called. As you come out of the airport, there is a massive sign at the top of the airport that says no loitering, no standing, no waiting. Underneath it are about a thousand Nigerians loitering, standing, and waiting. <laughs> Why? Because as I've come to learn in Nigeria, the law is a recommendation. It's not really <laughs> like stop, don't stop, pay, don't pay, yeah, think about it. But what are the macros? Nigeria is a province of 186 million people. It's a country of 186 million people. It's, a, it's multiples the size of South Africa. But then you consider its GDP per capita, only 2,200 bucks, half that of South Africa. So even at a macroeconomic level, if all you did was adjusted normative, the GDP per capita of Nigeria to SA, just at an acceleration to catch up rate, what would effectively happen is the Nigerian economy would buy easy measure overtakes South Africa as the largest economy in the continent. By easy measure. Then you consider, we have a 20% middle class, Nigeria only 10%. If you're not in Nigeria, you're not in Africa. You know, only 60% of Nigerians have access to power, but for those of you who have not been, uh, Nigerians also have two power cuts every single day. It's a part of the system of Nigeria. Two power cuts in Lagos every single day. One at 11 o'clock in the morning and another between 3 and 4 o'clock every day. For most people, you would look at this environment and it doesn't seem like the kind of environment where you want to do business. I met a Nigerian entrepreneur who makes computer hardware and machines. 
And what he's really gotten really good at is making computer hardware and machines that will, that will not cut or charge surge power and burn the machine's CPU just because of the power cut. So whereas most of the other manufacturers were not willing to look at it as an, as a, an innovation of sorts, he understood his environment and he's built a business. Transformation. Regardless of what skin color he is, he's understood the environment and has fitted his solution for the environment he's in. Let's go somewhere else. Ghana. Love Ghana. Anyone here ever been to Ghana? No one? One, two, the most beautiful country in the continent, bar none. And I say that because they have the most beautiful women in the continent, <laughs> bar none. And I say that because I have no, well, so, um, <laughs> Ghana's got a population of 28 million people. GDP per capita, 1,500. Size of middle class, 20%. What's Ghana's real challenge? The CD is too strong as a currency. It's four times the strength of the rand. In fact, you ever want to understand the Ghanaian currency? It's always the middle point between the rand and the dollar. The CD is just too strong. Ghana also last year ran a double deficit, both a budget deficit and a trading deficit. So it's a real problem for Ghana. But when you consider the economic potential of Ghana in unlocking Western Africa, it's a phenomenal place to be in and to do business. And lastly, the heart of Africa. If you ever want to understand the soul of our continent, you must go to Kenya. Anyone here ever been to Kenya, by the way? Any Kenyans in the room? No one? Love Kenya. Absolutely love it. 48 million citizens in Kenya. 1,400 GDP per capita. 17% size of the middle class. 60% access to electricity. So, if you looked at each of these four countries, as we call them in our firm, the four horsemen, and you compared them to their European counterparts. So if you looked at a South Africa, size of our uh, financial market, size of our complexity of our South African market, you probably compare us to a Finland or a Sweden. If you looked at a Kenya, for instance, and the size of that market, size of the middle class, you'd probably be comparing it to a Hungary. If you compared those countries to, those, to, to the European counterparts, you know from a resource perspective and an access to world markets perspective, we are not challenged. Yet, our economies continue to consistently lag behind their economic potential. The real question is why? And the answer is because rather than focus on the substance of what transformation means, we focus on the form of what it looks like. Who's in the room? Do they speak the right English? Do they round their R's? Or do they say comrade? Because if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, then surely it can't be a pigeon. And until and when you and I are able to move beyond what transformation looks like to what it is, we will be held back by the issues aforementioned. Mm. So how do we get here? Um, so God's been good to me. He's really been good to me. I live in a fantastic estate. It's probably the most expensive estate in Gauteng. I'm living. No, me, me, I'm fine. Me. Uh, I'm there. <laughs> you know, that's what I love about black people. We say, where? No, there. <laughs> I live in a beautiful, beautiful estate without quoting names. But as you come out of my estate, you turn right. 300 meters from where I live is Deep Slit. Just 300 meters. Now the problem here, the problem for me as I see it and I understand it is simply this. What is the difference between my children who grow up in this center of middle class opulence with access to all sorts of things? 50 megabit per second Wi-Fi, for instance, we have running through our estate and a kilometer just down the road, counterparts of theirs same race, same age, without bread on the table. What is the difference? If you watch the South African uh, news, often now and more often than not, you'll see service delivery protests. Have you ever noticed when you watch the South African news and you're seeing a service delivery protest, you would never see a service delivery protest that's half attended? You get that, right? Like if service delivery protests were concerts, it would be full all the time. 
we'd be filling up the dome every day with just the number of people attending service delivery protests. But hold on, let me tell you who goes to service delivery protests. Hands up if you're in the room and you've been to a service delivery protest protesting. See, this is it. When you're a middle class citizen who has to worry about paying their home, car, and credit card, you're busy engaged in economic activity. You do not have the time to engage in service delivery protest. So when you're watching a service delivery protest, rather than see a group of people who are a nuisance, understand that what you are seeing is a class of people for whom the economic promise of South Africa does not exist. It hasn't been realized. It's an academic concept. When a minister stands up and says, let the rand fall and we'll pick it up, you should worry less about the minister making that statement and worry more about the people who cheer. Because you see, if I have no rands, if I've never had the rand, its decline or appreciation is an, is a, is an academic construct to me. So let the rand fall, we'll pick it up, do you see? The broad question about how do we bring the majority of our population into a South Africa that delivers for them is not so that you and I are seen to be doing the right thing. It is so that you and I can sustain our quality of life. Because if you think the walls where you live are high enough, that the electric, electric voltage you run is strong enough, let me tell you, when the masses make a decision to climb over those walls, it will not be high enough, and you will not have enough voltage. History has proven it from the decline of the French kingdom all the way through to the decline of the Egyptian president just a decade ago, that sooner or later, a margin of people who are in the majority left outside of the economic system will topple the economic system that keeps them repressed. It fascinates me that finance professionals think their job is to pass debits and credits or to sign off audit reports. That's not your job. Your job is how do you get 40% of a population of people in a country with 60 million people into the mainstream economy? How the hell do you do that? That's your job. Your job is how do you get your organization, your job is how do you get your organization, your CEO to understand that we have 1.7 trillion rand sitting in cash in the balance sheets of organizations listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Excuse me, but how dare you? How dare you go into Deep Sluit? Sell bread at one rand, take 40 cents margin, 20, 20 cents and keep it in, in cash, and think you can keep it on your balance sheet. Who the hell do you think you are? Then you have the audacity, the unmitigating temerity to talk about a no-growing economy. You want to build the Mall of Africa, and you're not building factories? You want to tell us about a no-growing economy? And then we say we have transformed. Transformed what? And for who? See, my problem is I'm not a politician. I don't carry political cards. My view is politicians have the will of a, of a centipede. They will change their minds as soon as the odds and the, and the game changes in their favor. The worst thing you can give a politician is your loyalty. Politicians, like entrepreneurs, every single day should earn your vote. They should spend their time keeping market share by delivering on their promises. Yet so many of us are caught in the political discourse of what it looks like. How many black executives in the room? How many female? How many transgender? We have not thought about substance over form. Transformation is not changing blackness with whiteness or whiteness with blackness. It's getting the organization that was going into markets, selling expensive loans to poor people and keeping them poor to stop doing it. That's transformation. So why don't we do it? To understand why we don't do it, you need to understand how did we get here. How did we get here? <laughs> eh. uh, hands up, uh, comrades, if you have land. Eh? <laughs> hands up if you want the land. Eh? <laughs> I love the land question. Um, I do. I, I really love the land question. And I, I'm going to make a point that I'm almost sure will get me destroyed on the social media. Because you see, the problem with social media is it, on social media, people are more interested in looking to be woke than being woke. People are more interested in critiquing critical thought than actually analyzing and understanding it. 
You see, if you are obsessed over owning land, you're stuck in the first industrial complex of how we build industries. Land, labor, capital. The three factors of production. The most valuable company in the world today is Apple. The second most valuable company in the world today is Amazon. Where does Apple and Amazon own land, comrades? <laughs> Show me where. Think about it differently. Everyone in this room talks about the example of mobile money transfers coming from Kenya. This fantastic innovation called Mpesa. By the way, the Mpesa ecosystem has transformed how Kenyans exist. And I will show you what they've done. Some of the investments we've made in our firm, that's true transformation. But where did the entrepreneurs at Mpesa focus on owning land? Now, this is not to say the pursuit for land is not the right pursuit. But the question is, are we pursuing the land purely because it must be given back because it was taken? Or are we pursuing the land because we believe we can turn it into a productive asset of value that, that includes these 40% of people sitting on the sidelines of the economic system who are unemployed? Or are we just taking the land because we want to take something? And this is just a question. It's not one that, for which I have the answer. Now, let me tell you why the land question, for those of you who wonder, is so contentious. When I started my first business, I did. I went to the bank. I made the cardinal mistake of writing a business plan. I never should have. It was a waste of time. So anyway, I wrote the business plan. Then I went to the bank because I was employed. And I said to the bank, I'd like to lend some money for my business. And the, bank, the banker went through my business plan and then called me back about three, four days later. And the bank at the time had an arrangement with an organization, a state funding organization called Kula whose role was to provide soft finance to soften the uh, uh, risk rate for the bank, and the bank was supposed to plug in the harder, more debt-based finance. And he said to me, so Kula can potentially do 25% of the amount that you're asking, but for the other 75%, we need you to secure the 75%. So I said, sure, uh, with what? I said, well, do you have? Land. Land, yeah! That's what they said to me. And I said, well, uh, I mean, I don't at the time, and I genuinely didn't. I said, no, I don't, but my mom has a home. And I said, where is the house? Uh, my mother lived then and does today because my mother will never leave. She's one of those people. She will never leave. She's a community person. My mom lives in a township. And purely because we live in a township and the bank wasn't satisfied with the rate of appreciation and property value growth, the bank declined the loan for me to start a business. Yet today... That same bank has the unmitigating temerity to phone me and ask me if I want to have, be their wealth client. Can they do some offshore investing for me? Same bank, same brand, I'm almost certain, same credit people. What is the difference? The difference is the bank understood and worked my credit model based on the second industrial complex of thinking. He must have an asset. The asset must be one we can feel and touch. Then he's worth taking the credit risk. So that's why the land question is important. We'll come back to that in a minute. A second one. Is anyone here familiar with a pencil test? Yeah? Uh, for those of you who don't know, a part of how in the past we used to distribute what race you were is if a pencil was taken and stuck into your hair and it sat, you were black. If a pencil was taken and stuck into your hair and it sat, but tilted and slid, you were colored. And if a pencil was taken and stuck into your hair and slid off completely, you were white. That was throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and almost all of the 80s. The bad news is today, all of you here still have pencil tests. You just don't know it. You're not carrying pencils. When I got up here, how many of you here saw a man getting up or a black man getting up? When I started speaking, how many black people heard a brother speaking? Umfuetu speaking, or a coconut speaking. <laughs> Sounds funny, right? But I wonder, when did I become a coconut? When? Mm. Uh, was I a coconut when I watched my father get gunned down, nine bullets in front of me? Was I a coconut then? I wonder, was I a coconut when I watched my mother work two jobs just to keep us in Model C schools? Was I a coconut then? 
Was I a coconut when I had to come into an arrangement with my mother that for my standard nine in my matric year, I was going to get all A's because I knew she couldn't afford to pay to keep me in the Model C school, and if I got all A's, she would fight with the principals to keep me on the premise of my academic performance. Was I a coconut then? Was I a coconut when I started my first business and slept in my office for seven months? Was I a coconut then? When did I become the coconut? You see, <laughs> it isn't white needing to transform. All of you here need to transform. All of you. You need to convince white that it isn't better because it's white, and you need to convince black that it isn't different because it is black. You are not a white person or a black person. You are this thing called a human being. And you have the right to self-express, self-determine, and self-define as you so wish. If you want to twang, go for it. If you want to be woke, do you. But how dare I infer my preference of what it means to be you because of how I define you. Where I come from doesn't define who I am. It's just where I come from. These pencil tests we use every single day. We use them every single day. We use them every single day when those small businesses come to pitch for opportunities and we don't give it to them. When we run programs about who gets employed in our firms and it's only people that look like us that get given the economic opportunities. Yesterday, I had a meeting with uh, the partner network of one of the big four audit firms. And one of the partners says to me, you know, we'd really love to, to get more black skills into the firm. But the challenge we have is skills, man. Hey, we have a problem with skills. Now, mind you, the person that said this to me was black. So I said to him, do you know, if this was 1996, and you told me you couldn't find black talent because you couldn't find the skill, that would be a well-made argument. But 25 years into a new dispensation, if the skills don't exist, you don't blame the people who don't have the skills. You blame the people who are not transferring those skills. That's the real problem. When I was in investment banking, let me tell you what used to happen. A transaction would walk in through the door. And if it was a great transaction, new kind of work that every finance professional used to work for, I can almost guarantee you that almost all of my white colleagues got to work on that transaction. The black colleagues had to fight for space to be in the transaction. Because you got given the scrap work, you got given the work everybody did every day. Now five years into a trajectory, if my white colleagues get exposed to the right quality of work for five years, what do you think happens in five years? They get the skills. So when you turn around and say, we can't find them, they don't have the skills, you're right, they don't have the skills because you've not created a platform for them to acquire those skills. Do you know why Franschuk is called Franschuk? So, when the Dutch ran the Western Cape as we had it today, the Dutch knew that the climate of the Western Cape was particularly keen to farming wine. The problem was the Dutch didn't know how to farm wine. By luck, there was a group of religious uh, uh, refugees running away from France. They were called the French Huguenots. And they ran first into the area of South Africa where the British were, and the British chased them out. Why? Because at the time, the British and the French had an, uh, uh, um, an agreement of collaboration. So these French Huguenots sailed further south and arrived at what was then the Cape of Good Hope. And when they arrived there, they found the Dutch, and they negotiated with the Dutch. They said to the Dutch, we need a place to live. And the Dutch said to the French, if you teach us how to farm wine, will give you a place to live. They went and found an area in the Western Cape. It looks like a corner on the map, and they gave it to the French. French and Dutch is French, corner is hook. French hook was because that's where the French were stationed. In exchange, the French taught the Dutch how to farm wine. The reason why today the best wine farms in the world come from the Western Cape is not because the people of the Western Cape, who are predominantly male and white, were born with this God-imbued gift of farming wine. No, it's because they were taught and given time and learnt the skill.
Skill is acquired. Exposure, time, builds the expertise. So I asked the question again, are we changed or are we simply transformed? But I mean really, really changed. So what holds us back? What really holds us back? Let me just spend a moment quickly on this change versus transformation question. So what is the difference? Let me put it to you this way. Change is how the frog becomes. Starts out the tadpole, grows, eats, morphs, the tail disappears, legs emerge and becomes the frog. The same piece of matter that started out the tadpole is the same in substance and form that ends the frog. Change, linear. Transformation is how the caterpillar becomes the butterfly. Starts out the caterpillar, decides it doesn't hike its life, incubates and hives off, disappears into a small little cocoon, and when it emerges, the resulting butterfly looks nothing like the frog that started, like the, like the caterpillar that started. Do you understand? This is the real South African challenge. It's how do we create caterpillars in all of our spaces and in all of our environments that become butterflies? How do we really transform? But do it properly. Do it properly. Old Mutual did it in Kenya. They bought a lovely old man's business. Dr. Mwangi, they bought his business called UAP. Why? Because when Old Mutual first tried to en enter Kenya, they didn't have the local market or expertise. So they went and found the old man who was running the largest distribution insurance business in East Africa called UAP and they bought his business. But even then, you know what? Old Mutual didn't then take their business model and force it on the UAP management team. Quite the contrary. They said, you have local market expertise. We simply have global product competence. So why don't you tell us how this thing is going to work? Real transformation, not the look of it. Real transformation. The guys at UAP determined the strategy. They determined capital preservation. They determined product deployment, product development, market entry. They determined all of the strategies. They make the decisions. Real transformation. Substance over form. The reason we can't is because many of us get stuck in false positives. And I feel a pity, I really do, for black executives today. I really, really do. I think it's tough for many black executives today. Because many black executives get caught in an environment where they have to be seen to be black enough to deliver value and white enough not to uh, deconstruct the system as it exists. Yeah? I asked a friend of mine the other day, a black executive, I said, can you explain to me how come all of you black CEOs have white assistants? Like, what's that about? It was just a question, but it was just an observation. I said, how does that work? Like, what happened? <laughs> Miriam doesn't get the job. Like, what, what was that about? And it took him a while, actually. He went and gave it some thought. Two days later, he phones me. He says, Vusi, I have not been able to sleep because of that question you asked me. I said, why? He said, I've been an executive for 15 years. I've been in the C-suite. Four of them, I've been the CEO of a listed company. All of those 15 years, my assistants have been white. I said, I know. Why? And he gave me an answer that I think was the most brutal answer and honest in its truth. He said, because I exist in a system of whiteness. He says, my counterparts are white. My fellow CEOs are white. And to exist in that system of whiteness, I must myself bring around me elements of it. Now the question I asked him is, if you do that, can you really play a role in transforming the system? You're blinded by the spotlight. You know the problem with the spotlight, right? If I was standing here and this room were dark and the spotlight were on me, almost all of you can see everything I do and I can't see anything you do. That's the spotlight syndrome. That's the first false positive. The second false positive why we don't transform is we have a logic that impedes transformation. We've looked for reasons to support why we cannot transform. And we find the logic, it actually impedes it. The very first bit of logic, I've heard organizations say, well, you know, what is the business imperative for transformation? Show me how transforming our business helps us build a better business. How do we make more profits? You go, but no, you don't. Transformation and profitability are not the same question. You shouldn't even be having these conversations. Transformation you do because you must do. Profitability you do because that's the reason you're in business. But if you say to me you're not going to transform your business because you're not going to make more money, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, man. That's on the one end. Do you know what it looks like on the other extreme? It's that company that knows that to get the tender, 
it must have black executives. So it goes and it creates a trust and a structure. And it takes a community in Dipslut and gives them shares, which they never own. Black executives that it gives a couple of seats to a few Mercedes AMGs. And then it says, this is the organization that will pitch for government work. And typically they will call it public sector. Has nothing to do with the rest of the business. Stands alone, hived off. And that's where we keep black talent. Every single South African organization today that is a public sector enterprise, almost typically you will find black people in public sector. Do you know why? Because the organization is saying, whether implicitly or explicitly, you black people, go talk to your black people. Yeah, go talk to your government. Get the tenders and bring them. But we, we are going to make the computers. Eh? We'll, be, we'll engineer the computer. We'll make the car. We'll build the furniture. We'll do the job. You are just the sales arm. And then in 10 years' time, when all these black people have done is sell your goods and, make your, and sell your products, and they have no technical ex expertise to run your business, you go, why don't we have black skin? Ooh, black people. <laughs> Ay, man. Substance over form. You wanted the look of transformation, not it in reality. Not it in reality. Cool. So what's the burning platform? And I want to end with this. I really want to end with this. Um, when Grime asked me to speak here, I, I said to him, first I took this on with a bit of trepidation, and I'll tell you why. Because there are some of you in the room I can tell are visibly uncomfortable. Visibly. I could point you out, I just won't. There are some of you in this room who are completely disengaged. Typically, the white people are uncomfortable. The black people who are benefiting from a system that they know is not serving the purpose are, in, are disengaged. You don't want to hear what you're doing is wrong. Why? Because you must pay your bond month end. That's the reality. Here is the burning platform. I have three kids that I know of. No, really, I have three. There was one, then we did a DNA. No, no, <laughs> no. I have three kids. My oldest, Vosi, is seven. Vosi, you get it, Vosi? He's Vosi the third, eh? He's a lineage, this thing. So my oldest, Vosi, is seven. Amash is five. And my youngest, Mobi, is two months. Mobi's amazing, by the way. He's this big. And he's got the strongest legs you've ever seen. Like, he can squat more than me. I pick him up and I hold him and he looks at me and goes, Arr. and then he kicks up. He's got these strong, amazing legs. He's a real conqueror. really lives up to his name. So here's my problem. I could live elsewhere in the world. I don't want to. I really could. I just don't want to. I could think about changing countries and live here for half the year and somewhere else for half the year. I don't want to do that either. I want to be here. But I'm also clear that I don't want to keep driving into the township on the Saturday so that my friends with whom I grew up see me drive in in the coupe convertible and they don't have it. You see, I do that, as most black professionals do. I go to the township to show the people that I grew up that I made it. As a measure of my success is their failure, not their success. Yeah? So here's my problem. And I want you to tell me if you re reconcile with this. I worry about how do I make sure, how do I, Vusi Tembegwa, make sure that in 20 years' time, my children can go to a world of work that doesn't have quotas? How do I make sure that my son, who's a phenomenal athlete, in 10 years' time can get selected for the provincial team and it has nothing to do with his skin color? How do I make sure that my daughter, who does who's a ballerina, she does ballet. My daughter asked me, Daddy, did you do ballet? I was like, no. Where I'm from, there was no ballet. No joke, and this is, why, Daddy, didn't you have Teacher Christie? I said, well, let's just say, people that look like Teacher Christie were not there. <laughs> so my, my daughter's busy teaching me how to do ballet. But I worry about, how do I make sure that the world my daughter goes into, she can become a fully expressed ballerina, not worry about her race. Not worry about her gender.
not worry about her past or her history. She can fully recognize and reconcile with her potential. How do I give that opportunity not only to my daughter, but to that kid who lives 400 meters down the road in Tipsluit? So when they meet with my children in the world of work, they meet and are both equal to work and compete. That's the burning platform. Transforming South Africa is not about color. It's not about what the person looks like. It's about making sure that all of us in the spaces we exist do the things that need to be done today so we can have the country we want to have tomorrow. Graham asked me to share this with you, so I will. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I won the World Championship in public speaking. And I, and I came back, and two weeks later, my mom received a letter from the Nelson Mandela Foundation. And Nelson Mandela had asked me to come and meet with him. So the day of the meeting came, and it was school holidays, and my mom sent me to go and meet with Nelson Mandela. During school holidays, my mother dressed me in school uniform. During school holidays. <laughs> Black mothers, eh? No standard, no class. So my mom sends me to go and meet with Nelson Mandela. Now, I come from a township called Watville. You walk about 300, 400 meters from where I live to the nearest taxi. So I walked 400 meters to catch a taxi from Watville to Benoni Station. I caught a separate taxi from Benoni Station to Benoni Town, where the Lakeside Mall is. Another taxi from Lakeside Mall all the way through to Joburg Station. Then a separate taxi from Joburg Station to Houghton. When I got dropped off in Houghton, I walked seven kilometers to get to Nelson Mandela's office. So the point I'm making is I was much lighter than this. I just walked so much in the sun. <laughs> this happened. I was like Trevor Noah's complexion. So I get to Nelson Mandela's office, and I walk in, and there is a lady at reception. I was actually thinking about it the other day. The lady's name was Dudu. And there's this lady at reception. I went in and said, hi, I'm here to meet with Nelson Mandela. And she went and looked at a book, and she said, are you Vusi? I said, yes. She said, thank you. You can wait here. And she picked up the phone, and she phoned Nelson Mandela's PA. She phoned Zelda. And she phoned Zelda, and Zelda came, and Zelda said, hi. Are you Mr. Vusi Tatum? Tatum. Which, just by the way, on the point of transformation, my fellow white South Africans, if you live here and have lived here for all your life, I don't know how to say this to you, but you have, but I mean zero excuse not to know how to say black names. You have no excuse. Do you know, the first sign of acknowledging somebody's humanity is just their name. That's why when you make somebody a prisoner, you remove their name and you give them a number. You strip them of their humanity. It's not Vushi, it's Vusi. It's not Kakambile, it's Kakambile. But the blacks are like, yeah, not that one, that's tough. That's, uh, <laughs> Chief, not that one. So anyway, so she comes to meet me, she says, Mr. Mandiba will meet you just now. Okay. She walks me to Mandela's, Mandela's study. Now, Utata, by the way, if you don't know, had the most beautiful study. He really did. So as he walked in through the study, he had this double door. You opened the double door. And you walked in, it was this long, deep study. And on either side, from the floor to the ceiling, were wooden cupboards with books all along the cupboards, like a lawyer's uh, chamber. Right on the floor was a Persian carpet, right as you entered all the way to the back. And right at the back of the, of the, uh, of the study was this beautiful sort of French pan window. You overlooked the window, there was a fountain that ran down, Koi Pond, stunning. And in the middle of the room, he had this quaint little Chinese table with three chairs on it. So he says, please take a seat. Mr. Medivo will be with you just now. Okay. I said, okay. She then says to me, Mr. Vushi, can I get you something to drink? Now, my mom said, if they ask you for something to drink, mtanam, tell them you want tea, not coffee. I said, why? She says, no, because tea is high tea, you see. Coffee is come on. I said, tea. <laughs> is, is, is. That's why I don't drink coffee today. So, so I said to her, can I have some tea? Then she looked at me, asked me that question that makes every single black person uncomfortable. She said, would you like jasmine or Earl Grey? I was like, you don't have trinko? <laughs> Maybe choco, <laughs> nyan. <laughs> 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 
Put up your hand if the first time you heard of Jasmine or Al Grey was like when you started working, yeah? <laughs> you are lying. It's all of you, man. Some of you still don't know Jasmine. <laughs> he just wrote it down like, what is that, Chief? Let's reset. <laughs> oh, man. Woo. So I love this country. I tell you, the first time I was in a boardroom, it, it blew me away. The very first board meeting I had, I'll never forget. They made tea, and it was, they were circulating around the little sugar thing. You know the sugar thing? And it had those small little teaspoons. Now, where I'm from, sugar is a rare thing. <laughs> so when you can have it, you have it. <laughs> and they gave me this like tiny little teaspoon, and I kept thinking, do I pour the much as I want? Or do I pour one like all my white counterparts? <laughs> anyway. So she went and got me tea. Now, she brought me the tea with eat some more biscuits. I mentioned the eat some more biscuits because I thought that was a bit of racial profiling. I mean, I didn't ask for them. You know, I said eat some more, eh? Has anyone here ever been to Woolies and they serve those shortbread biscuits? You bought the... Hey, that thing is just eat some more, man. It's like so half the size and ten times the price. Just eat some more. So anyway, I sit. I'm waiting for Tata to come for the meeting. And I keep picking up the cup to drink it. Now, because I'm nervous, every time I pick up the cup, my hand shakes, and I spill a little in the saucer. When I put the cup down, it, it sits residue on the water. I pick it up, the water spills, right? I did this two or three times, and eventually the water started spilling on my white shirt. So I stopped trying to pick the cup up. I started leaning into the cup <laughs> to, drink, <laughs> to drink it. And, and then by this time, my eat some more biscuits had gone all soggy, so, so you can't eat those either. So anyway, here I sit waiting for Utata with this tiny little mess. Now, most people don't know, Nelson Mandela was a giant. I don't mean in sort of the sort of human sense. I mean, physically, the man was a giant. I'm 6'2", I'm 102 kilos. I can stand my own in a scrum. Nelson Mandela was 6'5", when I met him. I wear size 11 shoes, he wore size 13. The man was a tank. He really was. So, you all here walk with the ball of your foot first. Uttata walked with the heel of his foot. He had an incredibly heavy walk. You heard him coming. So just picture the scene. I'm sitting drinking this cup. Now I can't drink, so I start leaning in. And as I lean in, I'm looking to the door to make sure no one walks in as I sit, because that wouldn't look right. So I lean in, and then I heard, where is he? So, of course, I get nervous. And then I heard, Mr. D -d -d Madiba, he's in the study, okay. Okay. Then I heard, go, go, go. Gets to the door, he pushes it open, walks in, and he stands feet shoulder width apart, looks at me and he says, my son, come here. Now, <clears throat> my father had died recent to that, so, and nobody had called me my son since my dad died. So he calls me my son, and I swear to God, my, my tummy like pulled knots. And then, and then my throat clogged up. My face got really, really hot. And my eyes started getting like heavy and watery. And I remember thinking to myself, Vusi, you cannot, as a Zulu man, let a Kosa man see you cry. <laughs> it's like, don't, don't do this. <laughs> So, so he stands there, he does this, and as I was about to start crying, I stood up, I leapt on him, and as I hugged him, at my height, my face was on his sternum. He gives me this big bear hug. We sit down. He starts congratulating me on winning the World Championship in public speaking, tells me all the stuff he knows. And then we start sitting, and he says to me, I've got one hour, I've, I've got to attend to some state business after this. I was hoping we could spend some more time together, I really apologize. Then he says, so let's get going. Now, when my mother sent me to the meeting, she gave me a specific set of instructions. She said to me, look smart, sound intelligent, don't embarrass me. <laughs> I suppose the three hallmarks of how we all raise children. And I thought the only way I could do this was if I say nothing the whole meeting. I just keep asking probing questions. So we started the meeting, and all I did was I asked him questions. I asked him about where he grew up. I asked him about his relationship with his father. I asked him about the first time he moved to Gauteng how he met O.R. Tambo, how that relationship was. And then I asked him, have you any regrets? And he said, only one. Now, in his tribe, Utata was royalty. And for people of his tribe, when your first born son passes, 
the father, and if the father is absent, the father's brothers must bury the son. If they don't, the son is doomed to eternal damnation. He'll never make it to the hereafter. That's the belief. When Utata's son passed, he was on Robben Island. He went and asked the government to release him for one day to bury his son, and they said to him, if you renounce everything you've said against apartheid, it would let you go. He didn't renounce it, and he never got to bury his son. Think about that sacrifice. So we come to the end of the meeting, and he looks at me and he says, you know, they said uh, you are a speaker. I said, yeah, but that. He says, but man, you have not spoken. <laughs> Just ask a question, ask a question. Eh? Then he, uh, before he said anything, there was a knock on the door and it was Zelda. And she so sort of peeped in and said, Mr. Mr. Mediba, you need to go now. I, said, I must live, but before I go, have you any final questions? So I asked him the question I want to leave with you today. I asked him this. I said, what is your hope and your expectation for South Africa and South Africans? He said, South Africans need a little bit of faith. I asked him what is faith, he says. Faith is the ability to see the invisible, to believe in the impossible, and to trust in the unknown. I've just had the privilege of standing at a place that was built by my ancestors, but not for my ancestors. In a country that kept my people repressed for four centuries. Because somebody had the faith to believe it was possible. Yours and my responsibility is to leave here today, resident always, that they can rob us of our hope and our enthusiasm, but the one thing we must keep is faith that one day we will all have the country we desire. Thank you very much.